Hello. Let's do the fan cut. He's always at the top of the rating, so maybe this is it. We don't know. We'll find out. What is this? This is the logo of Go, the programming language. If you are here for Go, the programming language, you can leave. Because that's not what I'm talking about. What am I going to talk about? I'll just show the list. And go, obviously. We'll start with a very simple game. And using this simple game, I'm going to introduce you to Tree Search, Minimax, and then we'll move on to a more complex game, Knots and Crosses. And we're going to talk about perfect information and game theory. Then we move on to a bit more complex game. Um, then we need to do forward and backwards pruning. And then finally, we move to Go. And then we can forget everything I told you because all these techniques don't work in Go. Spoiler. Oh, now I have to do the voice. I want to play a game. So the game we're starting with is a very simple game. We take a tree. You can always start. And the one with the highest score wins. So. There's a jigsaw reference. That's a jigsaw. So, we start. Do we go left or right? Go left, left, because left is higher than five is higher than three, so. We start, do we go left or right? And suddenly it isn't trivial anymore. Um, yeah. For us, yeah, you can say, well, let's go towards the nine, but yeah, there's also a two there. But... So how would you solve this? Uh, turns out there's a very simple algorithm you can use, and it's called Minimax. In Minimax, you try to minimize the maximum score if it's the opponent's turn, and you try to maximize the minimum score when it's our turn. And this is basically perfect play. So in this game, um, both me and the other player, we know the outcome. We know there's a three, a five, a nine, a two, a six, an eight, a four, and a one. So there's perfect information. Both players know everything. Based on that, you can do a minimax search. And when you do minimax, you always start at the bottom. So the bottom is our turn and we can just pick the highest because we want to maximize our score. Obviously, we want to win. Then we move one layer up and we move one layer up. The opponent will obviously pick the lower score and we will pick the higher score. So if you write the minimax tree out, um, we'll end up with five. And that's the best we can do if the opponent plays perfectly and we play perfectly. We'll always end up at five. If the opponent makes a mistake, um, for example, if we go to five and the opponent says nine, yeah, we'll, we'll go to nine, obviously. But given perfect information, you'll end up at five. Today I actually wrote the code, so now I have Java code to show them. Um, how does it work? This is a recursive method, uh, minimax. Uh, the node is the initial node of the tree. And you need to say if you're minimizing or maximizing. So we enter the method. And if the node is an end node, we evaluate. So we look at the score. And we can just return the number. So we go down, we find the 5, we return the 5. If it's not an end node, um, first we uh, initialize a best score variable. Um, we start uh, at both ends of infinity. Then we loop over each child. We calculate the score by doing a recursive call. And if we are maximizing, we call max. If we are minimizing, we call min, and we return the score. So to solve the, the, the simple tree game, this is basically all you need. This is very simple. You can just walk a tree, calculate the min and the max, and that's the entire algorithm. 
this is just an example game. We'll, we'll go into more advanced games. So in our simple tree game, there are some statistics. We've got a branching factor of two, because at each point we split into two. The entire depth of this game is three. We go three deep and we have perfect information. Both players know the outcome of the evaluation. So, if you want to write code that can play a game, any game basically, these are the ingredients. You need a way to generate all the moves. So in, in our tree-based game, it's simple. We have the tree that are all the moves. If you want to write a chess engine, you need, uh, if you want to write a chess AI, you'll need a chess engine that can generate all valid moves for you. And from those moves, you get a tree because after each move, you'll get new moves, you get new moves, and eventually someone will win or lose. The second thing you need is to evaluate the nodes. If you evaluate all the way down, there's always a winner or a loser or a tie. So that's easy. But if a game becomes too large, like for example chess, you need to stop halfway. And you need to give a value to the node who's ahead. Um, are we winning or are we losing? The third thing we need is yeah, basically to pick a path. And that's the AI part. So that's it. We're done like five minutes in the talk and we can stop here. These are all the ingredients. So how do you apply this to a more complex game? For example, knots and crosses. Like knots and crosses. For some reason in Dutch, it's called butter, cheese and eggs, which makes no sense at all because it's three options, butter, cheese and eggs. And it has nothing to do with a knot or a cross. But okay, if we would draw the nodes of the tree of butter, cheese, and eggs, this is what you'll end up with. You'll start with an empty board, and then there are nine choices. So in this case, the X the cross starts first, and you can place it in nine different positions. And below that, um, there's a knot being placed, and there are eight options for each node. And yeah. Basically, I ran out of space. It's impossible to draw the entire tree. But a computer can. It's not hard for a computer to generate this entire tree. If you're like really smart and you want to shout stuff like, oh, but putting it in that corner is the same as that corner. It's just a rotation and that's a mirror. We'll come to that. So when we evaluate all the way to the bottom, what do we do? Well, we either win, tie, or lose. We can assign a value of 1, 0, or minus 1. Pretty simple. If we now apply minimax, the game is solved. You can always perfectly play this game. And it's the same code I showed before. That's minimax. So some statistics. This game has a larger branch factor. On average, it's 5. It's not entirely 5, but at the first node, you have nine choices, then there are just eight, then there are seven, then there are six. So on average, you'll branch out by five. The game depth, there's a maximum of nine moves. The board is filled after nine moves, so that's when the game ends. And if you would remove all the symmetries I was talking about, uh, there are 138 terminal positions. Interestingly, um, the one that starts wins in 91 of those cases. There are 44 times where the other player wins, and there are just three draws. But what happens if you apply minimax? You'll end up with a draw. So if you play knots and crosses perfectly, you'll always get a tie. Which is weird, because it's like, of all the terminal positions, it's just three end up in a tie. But Moving on to a more complex game. The noble game of chess. If you draw the tree for chess, it's already a bit more complicated. Um, there's, you start with an empty board. Well, not an empty board, but all the positions, uh, the starting positions. And there are one, two, three, four, five, uh, I've got a table. There are, so 
At depth zero, you have just one node. It's the starting position. After one move, there are 20 nodes. So there in chess, there are 20 initial moves you can make. At depth two, the other player also has 20 options. So you'll instantly have 400 nodes. And you can see after that three, four, five, six, after just six moves, the tree is getting pretty large. And this is gonna be a problem in, uh, in chess because chess doesn't normally stop after six moves. It's possible because you can checkmate someone in four moves, or actually in three moves, depth of four. There are eight possible uh, checkmates. I didn't know that, but the table says it. These tables um, are super valuable. I wrote a chess engine once uh, to write a chess AI. And these tables are used for two ways. Um, the first one is to generate all the moves. And when you start writing a chess engine and you run, um, you can easily run this, just generate all the moves. From those moves, generate all the moves. And if you're lucky after six moves, you'll end up with 119,060,324. But when I did it, I ended up with 119,060,322. That sucks. <laughs> you know there's a bug somewhere, but, but, but it's perfect. It, it's, a, it's a very good way to, to unit test and to find bugs in your, in your engine. If you, uh, and also, um, you can see the captures. Uh, there's, there are uh, ampersand rules. Um, Costling and promotions and checks and there are all kinds uh, of different uh, initial starting values uh, for these kinds of perfed tables. They're called perfed because the second way to use this is for performance. Um, if you write a chess engine, you want to write a fast chess engine. Mine wasn't because mine was kind of crappy and in Java. Um, but people are bragging so. At depth six, my chess engine did that in four minutes and just generate all the nodes. But these are super valuable. You can use these tables as unit tests um, to verify if you uh, apply all the rules correctly and you, you find all the quarter cases and just basically to measure performance as well. So what's the problem with chess? There's no more perfect information. It's impossible to calculate all the positions, go to the end, see who's won, because the number of combinations is, is mind-blowingly large. But luckily, so the question is, how do we evaluate a node? Because now we can't compute to the end. We have to stop halfway and evaluate. But luckily, chess has a simple way to evaluate a node. You can, for example, just count the pieces. If you lost a queen, you're probably not ahead. Also, and if you're tied, you can look at the uh, piece positions and the liberties your, your uh, pieces have. So there are, uh, for example, um, if your chess pieces are in the center, it's probably better than if you're on the corner. So writing an evaluation function for chess isn't that hard. To make a faster chess engine, or a better chess AI, you need to do pruning, snoeien for the Dutch people. So basically we need to cut back the tree. So we need to ditch nodes. There are two kinds of pruning. You have forward pruning, I'll come back to that, which is risky. And you have backwards pruning, which is a mathematical way to prune and it's completely safe, which I find is it, you get it for free. So what do we mean by forward pruning? If a move is too bad, just stop evaluating. If you do a move and the opponent captures your queen early in the game, it doesn't make sense to look at everything that's below that. Because you're not going to play that move. You're not an idiot. The other way around, if a move is too good, it's probably not going to happen. The opponent isn't going to randomly sacrifice his or her queen, for example. So let's not calculate below that. But like I said, pruning is risky. <laughs> A 
it's risky because there's always an horizon problem. If you decide to stop evaluating, uh, maybe sacrificing a queen sounds stupid, but maybe the next move is a checkmate for you. It happens, but you will never find it because you didn't search any further. So aggressive pruning in chess is very important, but don't be too aggressive because yeah, you might miss obvious things that are just behind the horizon. There's a different way to do pruning. And this is the mathematical safe way of do, to do pruning. Uh, and you don't have any problems with your horizon problem. For example, we're somewhere in a chess game and this is the tree. And we evaluate, um, we have the min and the max move and we end up with a tree. Tree is just a random number, higher is still better. So we continue and we find a five. Five is better, so we want to play that move. It gets promoted up. Now we go down and we find a nine. Nine is an even better move. But we can stop here. Why can we stop? Because we already had a five. And that's a minimizing move. The opponent sees a nine there. He will never pick that nine. He will always go towards the five. So what can happen in the other nodes? If it's higher than a nine, the nine will get promoted up because you're maximizing, but it will never replace that five. That five is stuck there. What happens if it's lower than a nine? If it's a two? Well, we want to maximize our move. So if there's a nine and a two, we won't pick the two, we'll pick the nine. So the nine is stuck there. You'll never go lower than a nine. You only get higher, but because there's a five above it, so you can basically safely stop evaluating this because it doesn't matter. And it works the other way around as well. So um, for example, now uh, the min and the max have been switched. Um, we are picking the highest number and there's a tree there and it doesn't matter what happens. If it gets lower, we'll still pick a five. If it gets higher, it doesn't get picked. It doesn't override the tree. Code, yeah, code. This is the minimax, and this is the same minimax, but I hit some stuff. Um, and I call it alpha beta, because yeah, that's what we're doing. We're doing an alpha beta search. So what's beneath? Alpha and beta, obviously. So what we do, um, we call a method and we uh, enter alpha and beta. Alpha and beta are infinity and um, negative infinity. And we evaluate the nodes just like we were doing in minimax. But next to we, when we calculate the score, we also update our alpha and beta. Alpha, are, uh, alpha is the, let me say this correctly, the, you pick the max, so alpha gets larger. Alpha is the lowest. A lower threshold, beta is the higher threshold because beta comes down, alpha goes up. And you can basically guess what's beneath this. If you cross a certain threshold, you can stop evaluating. But basically, we're doing the same as we were doing before. We're doing this. And it just takes three lines of code to do this. So now you can write a chess engine, and, and, a, and well, if you have a chess engine, that's pretty hard. But if you have a chess engine, writing a chess AI is very simple. It's just these lines of code. This is a, oh. Oof. Oof. Oh. this is basically a chess AI. And it's a pretty good one. And uh, if your chess engine is fast enough, it, it, it will probably beat me because I'm a bad chess player. So it's not hard to do game AI. So back to chess. Chess has an average branch factor of 35. So on average, when you take a chessboard, you can do 35 different moves, which is already a lot more than knots and crosses, both cousin and Also, 
um, this game doesn't stop after nine moves, but usually 40 to 50 moves. So the game tree is much larger, and we've already seen it's too large to compute because it's 35 times 35 times 35, that 50 times in a row. The good thing is writing an evaluation function for chess is pretty easy. Just count the pieces, look at some board positions. And even having it that simple, you can beat a professional chess player. It's that easy. And if you have a really advanced chess AI, you can look 20 plus moves ahead with some aggressive pruning. And that's more than enough to beat a professional. So chess has been solved. Um, Computers are just better. So now we take the final leap to the more complex game of Go. And it looks very similar for you, uh, for those who have never played Go. There's a 19 by 19 board. There are black and white stones. It's very simple. You take turns placing the black and the white stones, and you try to surround and capture areas. That's it. It sounds easier than chess. Chess has a lot of different rules, but this is pretty simple. So why is Go such a complex game? Well, when you start, there's a 19 by 19 board, and you're free to place it anywhere on that 19 by 19 matrix. And obviously, later in the game, uh, the board gets filled and there are uh, less options, but in general, you have like 250 different positions to pick from, each move. So there's a lot to evaluate. An average Go game has 300 moves. So if you want to calculate, you can do 250 times 250 times 200. Do that 300 times and see what you see what you add up with. That's the entire tree for an average Go game. The final problem is an evaluation function. It's nearly impossible to, to write a good evaluation function. Because of AlphaGo, I've seen a lot of uh, Go matches, and even the uh, professional commentators are, are saying, well, in that corner, it might be one or two points for them, and five or six stones here, and um, I think he's winning. And that's all based on intuition. Because even if you are surrounding an area and you're like 90% there, it's not obvious you will make it because that's just how the game works. These are the possible amount of board positions that you can end up with in a game of Go. And that number is larger than the amount of atoms in the entire universe. I didn't count them, but. Wikipedia says so. So how do we make a program that plays Go? Well, the most powerful method until this year uh, was to do a Monte Carlo tree search. So this is Monte Carlo. What do we know Monte Carlo of? It's casino. So how does a Monte Carlo tree search work? Well. Basically, it's, it's based on chance. We pick one of the nodes. We play semi-randomly, or just randomly, to the end. Just all the way to the end, 300 moves. And we'll look, did we win? Did we lose? What happened? And we do that as often as possible. And this gives a pretty strong indication of the strength of a, of a certain move. And that's it. That's like the entire, uh, all the Go AIs. This is what they do. Just play randomly, see, okay, we won 200 times, we lost 10 times, it's probably a good move, we'll go there. And that's also why the experts, one year ago, said it will probably take between 10 and 15 years before a computer can beat a professional Go player. Forget that. Because suddenly, oh wait, suddenly, AlphaGo appeared. 
So what are they doing differently? AlphaGo is based on neural networks. And the neural network is, yeah, that's what it says. The neural network is a computer model designed to simulate the behavior of your biological brains. So how do neural networks work? Well, let's do a short demo. Does this work? I hope it does. No, it does not. Obviously. Whee, don't do that. Wait, we'll just switch. If you go to the TensorFlow website, uh, if you go to, uh, wait, one step back. TensorFlow is a framework um, I think it's created by Google, but you can create neural networks in TensorFlow, mostly using Python, sorry. Um, but they have an online playground. And this playground is made so you can kind of get an idea on how neural networks work. And I find it really interesting just to play with it. But um, who here has played with this? Eh, almost nobody, that's good. So what are we seeing? Um, there's a data set. And here you can see the data set. There are just blue dots and orange dots. And the goal of the neural network is to classify them into two parts. So it needs to detect the orange ones and the blue ones. We have inputs. This is just a vertical line. If we remove the entire neural network and we would run it, nothing would happen, obviously. What happens if we add a neuron? Not two, just one. You can see wait, it has a weight to it. This neuron does some program, uh, some, um, uh, this neuron does some tweaking of the input. So there's a vertical line as input. This neuron changes it and it looks at the result. If we play this, you can see the vertical line moves and it moves to the side so it avoids the blue dots and it finds just some orange dots. And it gets rewarded for that. So that's like the most simple neural network. It has one neuron and one input. So what would happen if we have two neurons? Well, the input is connected to the two neurons and they, they get randomly initialized. So if I keep refreshing this, you'll see random values. The ways uh, the weights get updated and well you, we can just see the results if we have two vertical lines it can do much better it can find two um, yeah two parts but that's not enough right let's stop going back to one neuron what happens if we have two inputs so for example now we have a vertical line and a horizontal line if we would show some random inputs you can see it can now create a diagonal line by combining the two inputs. So if we run this, it tries to find as, the, as many orange dots as possible. Well, this is one optimal solution it found. Maybe we can find another. So now it found an, another local optimum. So what happens if we have two neurons? This is just, just playing around. Oh, because it has two neurons, it can combine the two diagonal lines to create like a cup. And the final thing we can do is we add another neuron. And this is enough for the algorithm to create a perfect solution. Because now it has all the orange dots in orange and all the blue dots in blue. So it won. So what happens if we create like DeepMind? It just takes longer, a lot longer, a whole lot longer. It takes too long. Let's randomly initialize it again. So you see, beer isn't always better, Mr. Trump. <laughs> okay, another example. So for example, let's remove some layers. And we want to match this. So it can do that. Our weird neural network can do this. 
but not all neural networks have the same input. For example, there's also this input. What happens if we add this input as well? Well, you can quickly see uh, the weight of these inputs are almost zero, and it's almost entirely uh, working on this input. So even though people say uh, a neural network is like a black box, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, basically by looking at this, you can see it's clearly not using those two, it's using this one. And if you would, if you want to, for example, compress a neural network, well, that's very easy. We don't need this, we don't need this. Uh, oh, this is also almost never used. Let's remove that and we can basically remove this. Oh, that's a bit too much. This is enough for the neural network because it's already a good match. And sometimes if you just have simple inputs, but you need to generate a complex pattern, for example, this spiral, let's add a lot of neurons. It can't really do this. This is too hard for given the inputs. The inputs don't match up with what it needs to do. It can create something, but yeah, it's not really working. It also has sine inputs, so sine waves. If we use those as well, it works much better. You can see it kind of resembles the spiral we need to match. So enough playing around. Stop this. So if you want to learn more about how neural networks work, yeah. The question is, the algorithm that's being used is, is basically just sign. Well, the algorithm is taking some inputs, in this case, one horizontal line, one vertical line, a sign and a sign um, vertical of a horizontal, and it's being run against a couple of neurons. And those neurons, um, yeah, there's just neur the neural network code. Um, yeah, it's, it, you have you you can easily find that online. And in TensorFlow, it's just as easy as define seven neurons. Um, and if you run that, it it could generate such patterns, and it could uh, this network now is able to find that pattern. So if you want to start using this, uh, yeah, another question. Me neither. Oh yeah. Yeah, so, so basically the question is, what's a neuron? Um, in this case, a neuron isn't, isn't a magic thing or anything. It's, you can basically see it combines the input with a wave. And let's create something very simple. Remove this and this and this as well. So we have this input horizontal line, we have one vertical line, and you can see the weight of the vertical line is, in, the, in this case, it's negative weight, so it gets flipped around, but it's a half, which is a lot, and the weight of the horizontal line is dot zero six, so it's very minimal. If you would translate that, you'll get something that's very vertical, it's a little bit horizontal. And that's it. That's the only thing the neuron is doing. It's combining those two inputs into an output. And if we would run it, it would now update the, the weights. So you can see the weights have changed. And this is now what it generates. So basically, you take two inputs that have a weight and it outputs. That's, on, that's the only thing a neuron does in code. So it just combines two inputs to one output. But yeah, the magic happens when you have a lot of neurons all connected to each other, combine all the weights, and you get something more, much, much more interesting. But play around with this. It's just a fun toy. I, I can do this for hours, but we don't have that time. So let's go back to the presentation. So very, very simple. That's a neural network. If you want to learn more, for example, about TensorFlow, go to the TensorFlow website. TensorFlow is mostly Python. The problem is most neural network and machine learning algorithm um, libraries and frameworks are 
Python. But there is deep learning for J, which is Java. And there are others that you've got Cafe, Torch, Theno. Most of them are Python. If you want to learn more about TensorFlow, there are a couple of talks, um, both of them tomorrow. Um, there's uh, Google Scale, they talk about TensorFlow. And there's also TensorFlow and Deep Learning without a PhD, which I'm going to attend, absolutely, because I don't have a PhD. So by now you're, on, you're probably wondering, how does AlphaGo do this? Why is AlphaGo different? How can it play Go while the other al algorithms are pretty useless? So basically, Google DeepMind, I'm not from Google DeepMind, they hardly release any information, but I've managed to, to find some information. And it turns out they created a couple of neural networks. The first one is called the Supervised Learning Policy Network. They took 30 million amateur matches. So no, no professional matches, amateur matches. They put it into that large neural network and they gave it a goal, predict the next move. So given a certain board, what is the amateur going to play? And the result was a 57% correct. That's pretty good. That's, that's, so it, it, most of the time it does the same as an, an amateur player would. Then they took that network, copy, they created the reinforced learning policy network. Like I said, it was a copy, but they gave this network a new goal. So instead of giving it a board, looking at uh, the result and did it match the result, we want to find the best move. And to find the best move, the network just played itself 1.2 million times. And it will base um, the reward of the neurons. So uh, you, in a neural network, you always have a feedback loop. And it will base that feedback loop on the outcome. So which version of the neural network did better? And then they took Pachi. Pachi is not the best Go playing AI. Go playing AIs aren't that good. But it could win. 85% of the time, without doing any search, just give the current board position, run the network once, and take the outcome. So that was already like, okay, we're doing something good. <laughs> then they created the third uh, neural network because they kind of ran into a problem. The network I mentioned before, the reinforced network, was slow. In computer terms, three milliseconds is slow. For example, if you want to do a Monte Carlo tree search, you play to the end as often as possible. You don't want to be waiting three milliseconds every single step. So um, to play to the end one time, it would already be 300 times three milliseconds, which is ages. So they took the neural network and they made it smaller. By making it smaller, they tried to keep it uh, yeah, as smart as possible, but you obviously lose information. But there are always cases where neurons aren't firing anyway, so you can just leave them out. So they try to compress that network. And it made it much faster, to microseconds, which is 15, I think 1500 times faster. They created a fourth neural network. Uh, they were all over the place. They took the, the same 30 million uh, amateur matches. But the goal wasn't to predict the next move. The goal was, given this board, who's going to win? Just, just tell me who's winning. Is it player one, player two, or is it a tie? And initially it had an error of point, uh, 30, uh, yeah, point 0.37, where point 0.5 is average, just a random guess. This network, uh, they did a self-play with it as well. So um, then the error came down to around 0 0.23. Still, it's a very simple neural network. You give, the, you give the board, predict the winner, and predict how much it will win, the, the weight of the win. 
so they started to test this value network. And this value network is like an evaluation function, right? So for a given board, generate all the possible moves. For all these moves, run the neural network once, evaluate, and pick the one that's most likely to win for you. This neural network, using this method, was able to beat the strongest known AI in Go, still without doing any tree search. So they were kind of on the right track. And then AlphaGo decided to combine all the pieces together. So they used the policy network, the first network, that predicts the next move. And they try to select the best moves to play. If, play, if certain moves are like completely crap, don't evaluate. That's the pruning part. For the good moves, check with the value network which of the moves have the highest likely outcome to win. And then, using the fast Walmart network, do a Monte Carlo search as often as possible. Because that's still a very powerful technique, but instead of doing random moves, we can now use the fast network to do smart random moves. So pick the best moves at every step. So that's a much more realistic way of doing Monte Carlo tree search. That in total is AlphaGo. And they were able to beat some Go players. Oh, yeah. During play, it doesn't do any reinforced learning. Um, reinforced learning is uh, during training, when it's playing itself, you basically have two versions, and, and the, the, uh, the weights get updated after playing itself. If it won, the, that, that, that network would get rewarded, and the other won't. That's the reinforced learning part. Okay. This, is at play. this is at play, yeah. So this is um, combining all the neural networks they've created into one program called AlphaGo that can play uh, Go. So they set a challenge. Um, that's Lee Sedol. He's considered to be the best Go player of this decade. People say he's the Roger Federer of Go. I don't play tennis, but... So it's a best of five. And just so Lee Sedol really tries his best, if he wins, he gets a million dollars. This is the challenger. It's a distributed version of AlphaGo. It's using 1202 CPUs. I think those two. And it's using 176 GPUs. Um, Google now also owns TensorFlow, but DeepMind wasn't at the time using TensorFlow. So it's just using CPUs and GPUs and not their own TPUs, which are TensorFlow processing units. So they were just using CPUs and GPUs at the moment. I think they're currently transitioning towards using TensorFlow, but I'm not from Google and they're not telling anyone. So who knows? This is what the, the, the contest looked like. Maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. Who saw it? Okay, okay. I was actually on a, on, a, on a skiing holiday, so in the morning I would, I would check this live and my wife would be angry. And... Okay, basically what you see here, there's AlphaGo, that's the computer screen, and the guy next to it is AlphaGo's minion, um, who just has to do the move. So he's basically a slave of the machine. On the other side of the table, obviously, Lisa Doll. And game one was, yeah, it wasn't very special. It was just like any other professional Go match, which is surprising because no, uh, no other gay Go AI was playing like a human. But this was just like any other regular match. So that was surprising. But Lisa Dolph thought he could easily win this because, yeah, we've seen the slide. It will take 10 to 15 years before an AI would take, would, would take down a professional Go player, let alone Lisa Dolph. He's a legend. But then came move 102. So AlphaGo doesn't move. Look at Lisa Dol. His jaw dropped. Literally. And he froze for 30 seconds. 
He's now thinking, what the heck? And he's starting to realize, I might not win this. And this is the moment I'm going to lose. God damn it. Uh, I mean, he did lose that game. That's so he's one one nil behind. In game two, but it, yeah, it wasn't a very special game. It was like any other go game. Game two was much more interesting because very early on in the game, here you can see the two commentators. The two commentators are really good nine den go players, and they are analyzing the game. And um, you can see in the bottom corner. Um, AlphaGo has played a black move, and it's this move. <laughs> but the commentators are still analyzing all the possible combinations that could be happening. They haven't seen this yet. Just watch their reaction. And it changes the value of an area when you have a strong group like this, because black doesn't have any point to approach it. Because it's so strong, and this is what uh, Thore from the uh, from the Google uh, oh. team was talking I'll about. Did a move. Um, hmm? Is this kind of, of evaluation? Uh, no hmm? value. Of that. That's a very that's Ooh. a very surprising move. I thought I thought it was I thought it was a mistake. Um, well, I, I thought it was a quick miss, but um, a click. Since, if we were online yeah, go, we right, call yeah. it click out. Yeah, it's a very strange. Something like this would be a more normal move. Yeah, let's just uh, let's just analyze what we were doing uh, because okay, this doesn't answer, make so sense. Well, you have to, you have to this think would about be this. Kind of a normal move, um, and black would white would locally white. Sure. Would yeah, but black didn't Actually, do that. Since this group is so strong, maybe white wouldn't. Okay. Um, oh right, that's right. Because what you were just yeah, saying, that's right, just settled. Right. Right. Because even if black does stuff like that. Yeah. So did they just just ignore what AlphaGo did because it didn't make sense. European champion Fan Yu said about this move, it's not a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. It's so beautiful. And it's actually for the first time that a Go AI was playing at a different level than humans are playing. And this happened to chess as well. The game of chess in the last 20 years changed tremendously. It used to be very traditional, very uh, very much uh, the same moves, the same openings. But in the last 20 years, because of computers, people started analyzing different openings. And oh, this sounds interesting. And I'm now an expert in this move, and nobody is. So, And people started branching out and doing a lot of experimental stuff. And the prediction is this is also going to happen to Go. Um, it's going to be a much more interesting game in the future. So Lissadol lost that, obviously. He also lost game three. And then came game four. And in game four, uh, it's Lee's arch rival. He said, this move was made with the hand of God. We all know the hand of God, but that's basically also the hand of God. But this wasn't a move from AlphaGo. This was a move from Lissadol. There was like a very tricky situation in the middle, and AlphaGo did a move. Uh, AlphaGo didn't know what to do, and Lee Sidol made a very risky move, and probably AlphaGo ran into an horizon problem there. It didn't analyze that situation at all, so it was taken by surprise. And because of that brilliant move from Lee Sidol, and he kept playing like nine, ten moves after that brilliantly. While Deep Go, uh, while, uh, while AlphaGo was in uh, time trouble, he managed to, uh, to to win this game. But it wouldn't matter. AlphaGo won the fifth match. So in the end, AlphaGo versus Lisadol turned into 4 1. So, conclusively, why is this important? Everybody's saying that 2006 is a horrible year, and I kind of agree especially since this morning. But nobody taught AlphaGo what a good or a bad move is. Nobody programmed an evaluation function for AlphaGo. AlphaGo isn't an expert system. Nobody put Go logic into AlphaGo.
AlphaGo learned all of this by watching others and self-play, finding out the rules for itself, using general machine learning techniques to figure out for itself how to win. And that is like the biggest breakthrough in AI in ever, I think. Because even if you take um, Deep Blue versus Kasparov, which is also something that people are still talking about, is, is a great thing for AI. It isn't. It is a, just a database. Deep, deep Mind, the, no, the deep, deep Blue, was nothing more than a database. It was just lo doing lookups of professional games and doing the Minimax tree shirts we saw like in the beginning of this talk. AlphaGo isn't like this. It doesn't have a table of lookups. It doesn't even know the rules of the game. It's all playing on a couple of neural networks and it's playing on intuition, which is crazy. And um, the people from AlphaGo are now trying to use this system not to play Go, but to put this into medical research. Um, so for example, um, you, could, you can input a lot of questions and uh, the machine can, can tell by intuition if you're sick and what your diseases are and what your chances are of getting diseases. So that's what I've heard, what Google is do currently doing with AlphaGo. They, made all, they might be creating Skynet, who knows, but they're not that open. Nobody from DeepMind is here to talk about it, but yeah, not a question. They are convolutional neural networks. Um, uh, the question is, what kind of neural networks are you using? They are uh, convolutional neural networks. But I didn't want to go into that because then I had to explain what a convolutional neural network is, and that would take a lot of time. So, I, I, and please uh, find someone from Google DeepMind that can talk more about this. I, I love the story. I love to learn more, but there's almost no information about these networks available. So, that's the problem. Other questions. No questions. Well, thanks. Don't forget to vote.